Speaking of 3D and 3D imagery, you may have been here in 2014 when we launched the Living Heart Project. Um, Steve Levine introduced the Living Heart Project and announced a, an ongoing partnership with the Food and Drug Administration. But you know, we've made a lot of progress. It was one of the things I saw. I went down into the cave and put on the 3D goggles and we, you know, you're able to visualize the heart. And you know, we're applying that technology now in ways that we didn't even think of uh, back then. So we're gonna go to a video that shows the, some of the progress we've made with the Living Heart Project. Please take a look. Everything's possible in our heads. The virtual world is really the closest to our imagination. The minute we go into the lab, we're instantly constrained by the machines in front of us. Today, everything can be imagined in 3D. It's much more powerful. Virtually every product around you is designed on the computer. We apply this incredible technology to help improve all the products that are around us, except in medicine. Your doctor is still dealing with 2D. It's been always said, a picture is worth a thousand words, and that is true in healthcare as much as anything. Each field moves at a certain time, uh, but we believe that 3D technology is ready and that medicine will get the same benefits that we've seen in every other industry once they embrace 3D. My daughter was born with a congenital heart disease. The left and right ventricles are reversed. So she's had a pacemaker since she was two. The biggest risk for her uh, is that her weaker ventricle wears out. Typically, complications set in when she's about 30. She's 28 now. Being a lifelong patient, you realize that a lot of people don't have a lot of involvement in their medical care. It's a little bit different when it's like the parent of a kid with a condition. So my dad got really involved and the doctors opened up to him because he's an engineer. As an engineer, you take things apart. With the human body, we didn't build it, but there's no reason why we can't understand it. We just need a different set of tools. We all see car crashes and we see crash dummies in them, but uh, they don't actually build hundreds of different kinds of cars. They actually build it on the computer and they crash it thousands of times. What we do for a living is actually help companies who build planes and cars to optimize the performance. I remember thinking, why can't we do that for the medical field? The heart for most of us is a mystery. So the Living Heart Project basically is building a realistic virtual version of the human heart. Her case is very unique. So as you can imagine, there's very little data, uh, no reliable data at all. And I thought if we could take our technology and build a virtual model of a human heart, we could demonstrate that the biggest way to improve the healthcare system we have is to help people to manage their health better to give them the tools in a form that makes sense. What we're able to learn from the Living Heart Project is providing insights into decision making. Everybody understands what the technology can do because they can see it, they can experience it. Those 3D experiences are incredibly powerful. So now, if I had an imaging study, you could make a model of my heart and you could actually run simulations of thousands of patients that don't actually exist. So I could know how this will progress, how any interventions would affect my heart. As her doctors tell us, by the time they see the symptoms, it's probably too late. So we're helping to give them the insights of what to look for first. You see coronary arteries, a little bit of fat. But... Ultimately, I would like to be doing bench to bedside, so being at the interface between 
uh, researchers and doctors um, kind of doing what my dad is already doing. <laughs> I think having a, a child with a health condition can be really scary. And what my dad did was to take that from being afraid of the issue and, and make something out of it. And, you know, I try to do the same thing where instead of being afraid of going to the doctor and worrying about the future, I want to be that doctor. The best thing to do is take what you're given and be inspired by it. What an incredible, incredible story. And it is projects like these and the investment that we're making in improving the frontier of things like medicine that makes Dasso System a very, very special place to work. And so to give us more and an update on the Living Heart Project, I want to bring to the stage Carl D'Souza, Senior Solution Consultant, Virtual Human Modeling for Dasso System. Carl, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Dean, and good morning, everybody. I would like to spend the next 10 minutes or so telling you about some of the ways in which the 3D Experience platform uh, is helping deliver on the promise of personalized health. And I hope you will leave inspired uh, by some of the things you see here today and think about how these tools and technologies can be applied in your own areas of expertise. So I like to think about personalized health as a journey, which for us began in 2013, when Bernard Chalice challenged us to think about how the 3D experience platform could help harmonize product, nature, and life. So we then asked ourselves, what if we could provide doctors with the same kinds of simulation benefits that engineers like you and me already deploy and appreciate? In particular, could we build a human heart model that could improve the understanding, diagnosis, and treatment of cardiovascular disease, which is the leading killer uh, of adults worldwide. Now, because this was a, uh, a challenging undertaking, we started by bringing together a community of experts to help us in this endeavor. We brought together communities from the clinical, the industry, <coughs> the regulatory side, and academia. And by 2014, we had more than 30 different organizations helping us in this effort, and we launched the Living Heart Project, as you just saw. We were also able to build a prototype Living Heart model capable of simulating the dynamic behavior of the heart with good accuracy. <clears throat> in 2015, we were able to release a commercial version of the Living Heart model, uh, the first of its kind, and really a major milestone in digital medicine. We also began using novel VR and AR technologies from the soul systems to bring this idea to a much broader set of audiences, which led to a surge of interest in the Living Heart Project and in simulation in general. <clears throat> Last year, we focused on more challenging yet important problems like uh, blood circulation, which is, of course, the primary purpose of the heart. And we were also able to offer the Living Heart model on the 3D Experience platform, where it can now be used in a collaborative setting and inherits all the benefits of the platform that you've been hearing about. <clears throat> this year, we continue to make good progress. Uh, in fact, today, I'm very pleased to announce that the Living Heart model is now available on the cloud. And this greatly expands its accessibility as well as the range of applications it can be used for. In fact, we are now working on workflows from the patient care and the pharma segments of the life science industry in addition to medical devices. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes giving you just one example of each of these different segments to show how simulation is driving personalized health. So in cardiovascular devices, we are working closely uh, with our customers and with the FDA to reduce device development time, to increase device reliability, to accelerate the progress towards virtual clinical trials, and then to someday, hopefully soon, be able to deliver, deliver truly personalized solutions. Some of the devices we've been working on are, are as shown here. And what I want you to note is that in each of these cases, it's possible to modify the heart model to introduce the underlying disease that you're interested in and then tune the model to match patient-specific or population-specific characteristics. And to give you a better sense of how that's done, I'd like to show you this example of the mitral valve. 
Now, in a normal healthy human heart, the mitral valve closes completely during cardiac ejection, as you see in the animation on the left. However, in some cases after a heart attack, heart muscle may be so weakened that the mitral valve is unable to close completely. This then leads to some blood leaking back into the heart rather than flowing to the rest of the body. This is called mitral regurgitation, and if left untreated, can severely degrade the quality of a patient's life. So we were interested in studying whether the device shown on the right side there, the annuloplasty ring, would be able to improve this condition, and we used the living heart for this. Now, the first thing we did was to introduce the disease condition into the heart model. And you see the big red patch in the, in the figure on the left. That represents the region of the infarction that was derived from patient data. Having introduced that, we then tuned or deactivated the normal cardiac behavior in that region so that we could reduce overall cardiac output as well as reproduce the incomplete closure of the valve, as you see in the animation on the right. So using techniques like this, it's possible to introduce localized disease characteristics into the heart to match your patient uh, <clears throat> metrics or your population metrics. Moreover, you can then look, assess how the treatment you have in mind is going to perform in that patient's heart, and that's what we've done here. <clears throat> so we simulated the procedure by which the surgeon would suture this device in place, and we can then see in the animation on the right that it does indeed improve mitral valve closure. Furthermore, we then conducted blood flow simulations in the worst case scenario. This is when the heart is at peak ejection, and we see that even though the device does not completely eliminate the problem, animation on the right, it still does a much better job than the initial regurgitation on the left, which can therefore improve patient's life. My second example is from the pharma industry. Now, one of the major problems facing the industry is that many promising drug candidates that appear to be safe in early development stages later on prove to be toxic in clinical trials or even after approval. In particular, some drugs are known to cause abnormal heart rhythms or arrhythmia, which can be fatal. So current drug safety protocols are unable to reliably predict what happens in a real human heart. So with our collaborators at Stanford University, we began a project to see if the living heart could help address this challenge. We began by building a new cardiac cell model capable of modeling the complex ionic dy dynamics that take place in individual heart cells after which we then coupled this model to the whole anatomically accurate living heart model, and we were able to predict, we were able to simulate the onset and propagation of arrhythmia. The animation on the left shows you a normal heart where you see periodic rhythmic patterns of electrical wave propagation, whereas the heart on the right shows you what happens when the drug Sotalol is administered. In this case, you can see the onset and the degradation of these patterns into chaotic rhythm patterns, which are characteristic of arrhythmia. We think this is a great example of multi-scale modeling going all the way from the cell level to the full organ level. And in fact, we are now working with our collaborators at Biovia to extend this technique all the way down to the molecular level. I should also point out that these simulations are extremely computationally expensive and were therefore run on the cloud. And we expect more of our collaborators and customers to avail of this technology now that the living heart is available on the cloud. My last example is from patient care and from a completely different domain. As some of you may know, schizophrenia is a debilitating mental disorder, and treatments where applicable can be prohibitively expensive, especially in developing countries like India. Over the past few years, a new approach has been developed called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, wherein very low amplitude electrical currents are applied to the surface of the head, and they can modulate neural activity below and reduce the severity of schizophrenia. But it turns out that these treatments don't always work in, in every patient. Uh, <clears throat> so having heard about the Living Heart Project, India's premier neuroscience institute, NIMHANS, reached out to us and asked us if simulation could help shed some light on why some patient, patients were more responsive to TDCS and some were not. So we began by building very detailed patient-specific high-resolution finite element models, which we then subjected to simulation. And the results of these simulations were able to predict the specific regions where maximal neuromodulation in the brain would take place, and then predict a probability of success of the treatment. We were also then able to take these results back into MRI space to facilitate discussion and analysis among the clinical community, 
who are now proposing modifications to the treatment based on the results of simulation. So having demonstrated the viability and the value of personalized neuromodulation, we are now working to consolidate this workflow and to deploy it more widely at NIMHANS. So I would therefore like to conclude by listing some of the key ingredients that we believe are necessary to make personalized healthcare a reality. Firstly, we need powerful simulation tools capable of modeling the multi-physics, multi-scale nature of the human body. We definitely need a vibrant ecosystem of experts who are willing and able to collaborate. We need novel visualization and interactive tools that foster creativity. We need well-defined end-to-end workflows to expand participation and speed the innovation process. And we need access to high-performance computing and data analytics tools, all of which I'm very happy to note are being developed on the 3D Experience platform. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.